Good morning. I'd like the door. Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to this very special occasion. Uh, I'm Michael Cohen, the director of the Graduate Program in International Affairs and of the Observatory in Latin America. And it's my great honor to, to welcome President Rafael Correa from Ecuador uh, to this event. Uh, we're very pleased and honored that he could come to, to the New School, uh, a university that has great interest in, 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 uh, in Ecuador, the policies that he's, he's pursuing, the interest in, in development, in finding alternative models of development, alternative models of policy. And as we were just discussing uh, before, a few minutes ago, uh, this is a university which has a long tradition of looking for alternative models in economic and social development. Uh, the Observatory in Latin America has had the honor in the, in, over the last several years, since 2003, to receive a number of Latin American presidents, including the late uh, President Nestor Kirchner, uh, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, um, uh, Tabaré Vasquez from Uruguay, and also Ojanto Humala from Peru. Uh, we've also had uh, visitors from Alicia Barcena and various other people here. Uh, so it's, we're very, this fits in within our program, which we call uh, America Latina in Marcha, Latin America on the Move, uh, a, a space in which we can hear new voices from the region, uh, hear what people are thinking and, and what are their proposals for, for development and for the future. I'd like to acknowledge uh, here the presence of a number of uh, very important people. Uh, First, uh, the, the, the Foreign Minister of Ecuador. We're very delighted you could be here, sir. And uh, Francisco Carrion. <laughs> Francisco Carrion, the, uh, the uh, permanent uh, representative of Ecuador to the Na United Nations, without whom this, this event could not have been possible. We're very much grateful to your, to your help in all this. We're also pleased to have here uh, representatives from uh, the Consul of, of uh, Venezuela, uh, from Bolivia, from Argentina, and we're, we're delighted that this could be a Latin American event in the sense of people from other countries interested in hearing uh, President Correa. Um, I'd just also like to acknowledge the, uh, the support of, uh, of many people in the university who've helped to put this event together. Uh, uh, Margarita Gutman, uh, Amanda Goodgall, Mandy, are you here in the back? <laughs> many of you have, uh, and uh, Pam Tillis, and many of the people from the our AV department and others. We have such a demand, Senior Presidente, for your to hear to hear your words, to hear your speech, that we have an overflow room in another building in the university where we have more than 100 people there looking and watching the, the, uh, the, the show uh, on live. We have also English and Spanish streaming uh, going out through the internet. We've received requests from uh, universities in the Northeast of the United States wanting to listen to the class. Your, your speech will be a offered as a class as well in, at Smith College in Massachusetts. So we want to welcome the people at Smith College uh, to, to this event. Uh, so there's a lot of demand, and we're really delighted that, uh, that you could be here today. It's now my honor to introduce uh, President David Van Zandt, the president of the New School. Well, well welcome again to everyone uh, who we, we could fit into this room, and then people who are in other locations uh, uh, around the United States and around the world. Uh, before I introduce um, our guest, I just want to mention that, that 2011 is the 10th anniversary of, the, of our own graduate program in international affairs. Um, and it's a, it's a program that has really grown in that time. We have over 400 graduates um, from 62 different countries, and including a number uh, from Ecuador uh, that have gone through our program uh, over the years. Um, the New School has also been very active in Latin America, as, as, as Michael mentioned. I myself uh, have returned in the last month from a visit to Buenos Aires, where I was participating in the jury that made the final selection for the President Nestor Kirchner Fellowship. And one of our three finalists uh, who will be visiting the New School in, in the near future is Erica Paredes from Ecuador. And so we were pleased to be able to give the fellowship to an Ecuadorian. 
Um, well, now it's time uh, to welcome our special guest, uh, President Rafael uh, Correa, uh, Correa. He was elected president in 2007 and re-elected in 2009. Uh, he trained as an economist, receiving his PhD um, from the University of Illinois. He has been very involved in rethinking economic policy in Ecuador and in Latin America as a whole. He's been a strong uh, supporter of UNICER, the Banco del Sur, uh, Banco del Sur, and also in finding ways for the region to deal with the volatility from the global financial, uh, financial, financial markets. Um, he's particularly interested in finding a reasonable strategy for dealing with natural resources in his country, and that's a problem that affects many countries, uh, many countries around the world. Today, he will speak about that issue in the context of, of Yasuni ITT project, which is intended to protect Ecuador's natural environment and contribute to fighting climate change by foregoing revenues from some of the country's oil reserves. Please join me in welcoming uh, President Correa. Bueno, queridos asistentes. Okay, their guests, their colleagues, their friends, and uh, those who are listening to me in some uh, room via video in another building, and all those uh, countries in Latin America that are following me over the internet. Well, hello, this is why I was asked to give this uh, conference in Spanish, which uh, it would be easier for me, even though I'm so tired that I can barely even speak Spanish, but presidents that are not subject to the usual uh, guidelines are accused always of uh, this is the only human rights that uh, I, might, I might actually have are the human rights for the poor interpreters, which I, and to whom I now apologize. I'm always their uh, torture. I promise them that I will try to speak slowly, which to me is extremely hard to do. Nevertheless, I'm talking about uh, an attempt against human rights. I'm told that the Council of Venezuela and the Council of Bolivia are here. And hello, where are you from? Oh, Venezuela. Are, uh, is Venezuela here? Cuba, you know? You know? What's your name? Well, you know, I'm so important that now I'm a non persona non grata in the US. I never thought I'd be that important. On behalf of the freedom of expression, they have forbidden me to uh, give a talk in Union City, I believe. And what is the, what is the proof? The proof is that I'm, uh, I'm shaking hands with President Chavez and President Castro. In any case, I'm not sure how to thank the mayor of Union City because I've had so much advertising for him. Thanks. It's because of him that all my talks are full and people are following me on the internet, so thank you very much. And uh, I hope he knows what uh, Ecuador's capital is because if we ask him, he probably doesn't even know that. Anyway, we know what we're fighting against. Anyway, let me uh, tell you that at the end we'll try and have uh, questions and answers. You know, before I got all involved in this big mess of being the president of the uh, country, I was a teacher, I was a professor, and it is so nice to come back to academia because there is so much contradiction and uh, such a change in way of life. In uh, the academic world, is a sin not to say tell the truth. In the political world, it seems the opposite. So I always love being in an any kind of university, especially the new school, which we admire so much, Mr. President. I, um, I usually feel like I'm at home, I'm sorry to say. So it would be a very free exchange if we have enough time for questions and answers. Unfortunately, I have other activities today, so I've been uh, going like this for 15 days. But in any case, I hope we have enough uh, of a chance for questions and answers. I'm not sure what uh, we'll do about people that are in other buildings. So let me begin formally. I'd like to extend a brotherly embrace on behalf of my people. We begin talking about the citizens, but at the end you, you uh, extend their welcome to the presidents. But the presidents and all the government officials are only the first line of service towards our people. So we'd like to extend a warm welcome, a warm uh, embrace to the students, to the authorities of the New School of Social Research, and embrace to the government team that's with us. We have the sports minister here with us, Pecopanco Ceballos. You know he was uh, the uh, goalkeeper 
of uh, the soccer game in Betty Tola, our immigration secretary, our minister of foreign relations, Ricardo Patiño is here with us, our minister of uh, heritage, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, our minister of natural uh, non-renewable resources, Wilson Pasto, the uh, representatives of the army, the head of the military, the ambassador to the UN, our minister of tourism, Freddy Elax, our national secretary of communications, and also people from the Amazons, that marvelous region of the planet, the reason we're here today. I'd like to also uh, say hello to Michael Cohen, the director of uh, this program of the New School of Research Research, the president of uh, the New School of Social Research, David Bansom, and others. Usually, I get a draft of my uh, speech so that I could sort of follow what I'm going to say. These speech, these guidelines, were given to me by Minister Espinosa, but she is a fanatic of uh, Yasuniti, so she just created some advertising, a commercial, a one-hour commercial promoting Yasunit ITT, but we are in such an important academic center, so I'll try and be much more academic in my talk. I hope I'm not uh, too boring. I will mention some important uh, economic concepts on which this Yasuni ITT is based. It's not just a, a will to believe, uh, the will to save these natural uh, resources, but there is also some uh, energy logic. There is a lot of uh, financial soundness be behind this initiative. But first of all, I started to talk too fast. I once again apologize to the interpreters. Once again, let me begin with a warm brotherly embrace. Uh, greetings on behalf of my people from a country whose dreams are so high, as high as the Andean condor, the biggest flying bird in the, in the planet, and the fascination of the little hummingbird, which is the only bird in the world who's able to fly backwards. Our mountains, they're crowned with eternal snows, are the ones that are closest to the sun because they rise in the planet's equinox. In front of continental equator, there are the enchanted islands of the Galapagos where Charles Darwin supported his theory of the evolution of these species. Part of the Amazon tropical forest, which is one of the biggest lungs in the country, is also part of Ecuador. In only one hectare, you could find more tree species than in all of North America, Ecuador. Approximately one-third of France's size has approximately 10 million hectares of different types of forests that cover 55% of the national uh, land. Ecuador is the first in vertebrae animals, uh, 9.2 species every uh, millions of uh, square meters. We have uh, amphibians which are, account for 10% of the world total of amphibians were fourth in terms of birds. 1,626 species representing 18% of the bird species in the world. 37 of these are endemic, meaning they are exclusively from Ecuador. We are fifth in terms of papillonide butterflies. There are 69 species, three of which are from Ecuador, where the six in terms of world uh, earth biodiversity if we put together uh, land and water biodiversity ecuador has even more if we do it the other way around we are the first in terms of species in the world the amount of species in the world we're seventh in terms of plant variety we have 17000 species we estimate that there are approximately 4000 which are endemic out of all the orchards in the world, 18% grow in Ecuador, which is positioning itself as the producer of the prettiest roses in the world. But, you know, there are other countries that do produce roses, but there are very few that may produce orchids. And Ecuador that has less than 0.5% of the world's surface has 18% of the total of orchid species in the world. 
We're eighth in terms of reptile diversity. There are 396 species. Uh, some, uh, some of these reptiles became politicians, but that's a different story. There are close to 14 million inhabitants in Ecuador and 14 indigenous people. And some are here. Are you Oranes? Oranes. Great. People of the uh, forest in your native language. We have the Quechos from the Amazonia, Zagua, the Chaches, the Eperos, Sachi, Sandua, Siguar, Guarani. There are at least two clans that are voluntarily um, isolated. Tagaeri, Tanunminani, who are in fact living in the Yasuni Park, the Siona, the Cofanes, the Secoya, the Suarez, Zaparas, the Suarez. And we have the diversity of people that belong to the Quechua people who have their own language and culture. And within this nation, there are also uh, peoples with their own cultures because they speak the same language. Within the Quechua, we have the Pasto, the Otavalos, the Natahuelas, the Caranquis, the Cayambis, Saraguros. Uh, poor translator, Palta Cañari, Quisapincha, La Vela, Salasaca, Chibuleo, Guaranga, Panzaleo, Curua, Manta, Juan Cabilca, and the original nation, Quitucara. With them, we also have Afro-descendants, Montubios from the coast, Cholos from the Santa Elena Peninsula, all people of, uh, of very old cultures with many languages and origins, with wisdom from their ancestors, who Ecuador, in their 2008 constitution, became a plurinational and multi-ethical country. These are beautiful and unique people with all kinds of skin colors, with an open soul to our brothers and sisters of the earth. Good people with generous hearts that through me greet you and invite you to visit our beautiful country. All I've said is not in a country such as big as the US or with as many people as in China, we have only 250,370 square kilometers, which is approximately the size of the state of Colorado. The 17 countries that have uh, biodiversity in the planet, Ecuador is the most compact. There are other countries that have as much biodiversity, but their territory is bigger. Ecuador is the smallest in the world with such uh, diversity, but it's very ethnically diverse, one of the very few countries that still has human people that have not had any contact with others. Because of its diversity, because of the uh, geographical location, Ecuador is the eco center of the world. If you visit Ecuador, you could see in seven days all of Latin America, their beaches, their mountains, their tropical forests, their islands, but the most important thing, it's people. We are a people of peace. For us, human beings, their well-being, equal and a fair development, their good living, the sumat cow side of our ancestral people. This is in Quechua. That means well living, not just acu not accumulating, not materialism, but rather live in harmony with nature and with your brothers and sisters. The sumat cow side of our ancestral people are the beginning and end of our government measures. Beauty. The beauty of a country such as Ecuador is a constant call to take care of the only planet that we have. In order to do this, let me give you a brief background on the economic problem of the environmental goods and of its conservation. These Environmental assets are public goods. They are free access and needed for consumption. I can breathe the air, of the pure air of the Amazonas, and nobody can stop me. But if you want to buy a cake and, or uh, something in the university bar, you have to pay. It, is no, it has no rival in terms of consumption. The fact that I breathe this air, you can too. The fact that I'm enjoying this conference, or you are, Maria Fernanda can also enjoy it. There is no rivality. We can all use it. But if I eat a piece of cake, no one else can eat the same piece of cake. That's, uh, that's a rivalry. Uh, that's a competition in consumption. 
As a consequence, because of its uh, high value, it could stop. It, could, it, it may not have an explicit price. If we don't have a capacity to exclude, there is no monetary price. What is the price for the environment? We can put the price to a piece of cake. Anybody can pay for it. But if you need, if you have to have prices in order to have goods, you need the capacity of exclusion in terms of that asset. But the environmental assets don't have that capacity. They're public. They don't have a, a, a specific price, an explicit price. The market system, therefore doesn't generate it nor preserve them, these assets. The generation and protection of public assets, of world public assets, need collective action. It's not the market exchange that's going to preserve the environment. We all have to agree on preserving the environment. That is what we call yeah, collective global action. It also requires a profound change in economic logic where we can compensate the generation of value and not just the generation of goods. This means also, and this is very important, this is where we always talk in theory as economists because we always say we're scientific. I'm an economist, but I'm also a nice guy, right? And I'm a good person. But in any case, we always forget this, economists do, because we want to turn econ economics in hard science. We forget to analyze the uh, relationships of power, distribution, and politics. We believe we can actually analyze uh, humans in a vacuum, but that's one of the biggest faults of uh, economic analysis. So what I'm saying is that to compensate the generation of value implies that there is a political problem to redistribute the global income. If, for instance, I want to buy a tractor from the U.S., I must pay for it. I must compensate for the tractor. It has a price. If I want to use it, I must pay for that price. However, the environment that uh, the Amazons generate is the lung of the country without which human life on Earth would suffer and may, in fact, be extinguished. Countries of the Amazon basins, basins do not receive a cent in exchange for that. The most important progress made by the market economy, of course, we need uh, a regulation and collective action in order to generate and preserve the environment. Tal assets has been to look for a better balance of the environment through carbon uh, ex uh, credits towards projects that uh, help reduce the uh, greenhouse gases. These uh, credits, and you probably know this, there is collective action here companies that need to pollute, need to have a uh, cup, which is given according to how many carbon credits it has. But these credits, those who signed the Kyoto Protocol, and this is what I'm going to talk about, give these to countries that decrease their emissions. Say they use a hydroelectric plant instead of thermoelectric plant. That's a, just a simple regulation control. And that's the market mechanism. These credits are exchanged in the market. Those who offer them receive the uh, bonds, and the, uh, the, the ones that need it are the companies. They must purchase these credits. This is why I mean this is some progress uh, done by the market economy, but let's not kid ourselves. This is because it's a collective effort, regulation and control. These credits, this bond, one of the three mechanisms that the Kyoto Protocol uh, proposed in 1997 are uh, tradable. Each represents the right to uh, emit one ton of CO2. We know these incentives were insufficient and inefficient, in fact, even unfair, among other reasons, because the system rewarded countries that reforested but did not uh, reward countries that had not deforested and whose uh, 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 forests were contributing to the decrease of CO2. This is the science of incentive. If you have good incentives, the people do what's socially desirable. Without incentives, you may do exactly the opposite. So, say, if I awarded those who planted trees because it cleaned up the environment, but I did not compensate those who never cut these trees that were already cleaning up the environment, then if somebody just wants financial profit, what are they going to do? They're going to first 
cut down the trees, sell the wood, get money for that, and then get more money to replant trees. Do you know what I mean? This was inefficient, inconsistent, and unfair. Oh, well, Derek. And our... Yvonne back and Bodere. Hello, welcome. This is why currently we're discussing the possibility of paying developing countries for the value of carbon that's been uh, saved in their forests to f avoid deforestation and provide financial attractive to sustainable forest management. In, what is known as the REDD mechanism, reducing emissions from deforestation in developing countries. As I said, these are important steps that we support fully, but still insufficient, inefficient, and in fact, even inconsistent. These are just the patch ups without the concept that really defines clearly what we need to compensate. We're just writing a shopping list, we do this, we buy that, but there is no concept that unites logically what we need to compensate. The fact of, of, of compensating for avoided deforestation and forestation, so the decrease of emissions, say, by building a hydroelectric plant, should be incorporated in this global concept. This concept is the concept of net avoided emissions, E-N-E, N by their uh, letters in Spanish. This is the concept that I presented in the climate change conference in Cancun in 2010. Net avoided emissions, N. N are the emissions that could be uh, issued in each country's economy, but they are not. They or emissions that already were in the economies of the countries have been decreased. We have a clear example to replace a thermoelectrical plant for a hydroelectrical plant, which decreases emissions. However, we must also compensate the fact that there are no emissions, as I'll show you later on in net terms. To clean up, to decrease, means not to pollute, and not to issue which is the concept of net avoided emissions. This concept allows us to conciliate the Kyoto mechanism and the REDD mechanisms. However, any goes way beyond that. It does not limit itself to specific activities. It includes other economic activities that include the use and um, of uh, renewable and non-renewable sources to compensate for actions and inaction or action and omission. You can compensate the action, which is to forest, the non-actions, the forest. But all of this is part of this ENE -E concept. Say, for example, different producing countries that uh, have fossil fuel, which are highly polluting, such as the oil, could choose between extracting these resources or not and could be compensated for the emissions they would avoid producing. In other words, this would be compensation for not acting. Leave the forest as is. They're paying me for doing something I have a right to do, which would be to cut up the trees. In other words, ENE -E is a global concept allowing us to define what do we have to compensate. If we compensate these net avoided issues, is based on environmental rights and economic logic. The main idea of E&E &E is that a country can be compensated so that it would not act on something that it has a right to in case it's producing externalities that are not necessarily desirable. And if it, it, it could even, for instance, uh, produce negative externalities, I have the right to cut down my forest, but it's uh, profitable because I can sell wood, but globally we're hurting the environment. We need to compensate them so that they won't act on what they have a right to act on. In other words, if a country has no obligation to act on something that could uh, produce a positive externality, which is, for instance, to reef uh, or forest, it's, in my opinion, very profitable to plant trees, but then it should be compensated for not doing so. 
that's uh, in terms of rights, what you're compensating for. In terms of the environment, any is obvious. In net terms, we mustn't pollute the environment. You get compensation for not acting, for omission, even though you have the right to act. And that would be the equivalent of cleaning the environment. You compensate for uh, inaction without, uh, uh, in other words, leave the oil underground. Because you could take it out and, and pollute in terms of the environment. If you don't pollute, you're cleaning up. Because if I took it out, it will contaminate. So leave oil where it is. Because you don't you, you use oil to generate energy by burning it, and it uh, pollutes. Plant forests. This is uh, to clean up the environment. I'm cleaning it, but in net terms, if I don't clean, if I don't if I don't uh, pollute, or I clean, it's the same thing. It's obvious to compensate net avoided issues. And in terms of economic logic. In the basis of the right of um, uh, environmental rights, it makes sense. In terms of economic logics, these net avoided emissions, as well as compensation to generate or support, maintain environmental assets that are free, uh, free to access and have no market price, then this is based on the need to compensate the generation of value, and that's what's important: the value, the ability to compensate for needs, value the value to uh, fulfill innocent needs. We have value. Assets are just a part of merchandise commodities. These have a, a specific price that you can trade in the market. What's important is to have these assets, high value ash assets, which means you can fill needs. You must compensate the generation of value and not just the generation of goods in order to uh, increase well-being, social well-being and sustainable development. And there is a very essential idea here, a strong and fundamental idea. Let's be realistic. The preservation of the environment in poor countries would not be sustainable if it does not generate clear and direct improvements in the uh, standard of living in the, of the people. In other words, I cannot add it demand of a poor family that has no other you know, source of in income that lives next to a forest not to cut down the trees. In order to keep the forest, we need this family to receive the direct benefits from this situation. Now, if we increase the Kyoto incentives towards this ENE, -N -E, we could take a revolutionary turn in these international exchanges because we could allow many countries to become, especially those uh, developing countries, we could allow them to export environmental services. Specifically, it would revolutionize energy policies. We have our Minister of Non-Renewable Natural Resources with us, who I think uh, won over the ecologists. He was the first one to uh, access the uh, oil. Uh, resources. I think he's going to be named uh, Minister of uh, the Environment. Anyway, first of all, this would revolutionize the energy policies. Those who produce fossil fuel, which is highly pol uh, polluting, would have the freedom to choose extracting the resources or not. And they could be compensated for CO2 emissions that would be avoided. That doesn't, it, that's not what Kyoto does at the moment. It only, comp it only compensates if you do not uh, pollute. Uh, it does not uh, compensate for not extracting, for not contaminating. So this ENE -E is analogous to cutting down trees or not. I, let the, I left the forest as is. I'm cleaning it up. I get compensated. I left oil without exploiting it. I should be compensated. In net terms, the fact of not polluting means you're cleaning it. You, you mentioned before this type of that this type of initiatives had immense implications. That is to say, the poor countries would generate environmental assets would eventually be properly compensated for the invaluable services that they're providing for the life of the entire planet without needing to resort to cooperation exchanges or charity. 
they would be providing invaluable services to the entire planet, and they wouldn't need to resort to cooperation, exchanges, charity, etc. But let me emphasize once again that it would be strict justice, and at the same time it would allow the move from extractive type economies to service exporting economies, in this case environmental services. The response to the poverty of many countries is, consequently, trying to emphasize in a logic of justice and not a logic of markets. It would reward those countries that generate goods and services independently of whether these countries have or don't have the capacity for exclusion, that is, market prices. In other words, compensating for the generation of value and not exclusively the generation of merchandise, which is what the current market context supports. But let's not get it wrong. There are some, uh, some economists believe that uh, economic, uh, economist is a positive science, and they want to view economics as a science of inalterable mathematical equations. In order to achieve that compensation for the generation of value, we must change the world relations of power. Just imagine what the situation would be like if it were in reverse, and the generators of environmental goods were the rich NATO countries, and the poor countries were the contaminating, the polluting agents. Who can doubt that a long time ago, invoking international law, moral, and ethics, they would have forced us to pay them fair compensation, quote-unquote, Unfortunately, as Trasimachus said to Socrates more than 3,000 years ago, justice is simply what is in the interest of the strongest. Four years ago, dear friends, in this very city, my government projected to the world the Yasuni ITT initiative as an innovative, avant-garde, revolutionary initiative with the confirmation of 846 million of heavy crude in the ITT field, Ispingo Tambo Chuka Tiputina, it's still the largest proved reserve in the world, found in the Na Yasuni National Park, one of the most important biodiversity reserves of the planet, which, if used, would generate 407 million tons of CO2. Ecuador presented to the world its decision to maintain on an indefinite basis that oil in the earth, but at the same time demanding the co-responsibility of the international community in the struggle against global warming. We didn't produce global warming. We want to combat it because it affects all of us. But we're not going to be simpletons. Here we need co-responsibility, not charity, in the struggle against global warming. That is to say, by demanding a compensation above all by those countries that have historical responsibility for climate change. And generally, by demanding contributions from the entire world, contributions and compensation that need to reach at least half the net present value of said reserves, or the market value of the net avoided com emissions, 407 million tons of CO2, which would not be sent into the atmosphere. If this were represented in carbon credits, that would have a market value. Ecuador created a trust fund administered by the United Nations whose principle would serve for re renewable energy projects with a set and safe return. Uh, these 
the fund's returns would be used to preserve the natural areas protect, that are protected in Ecuador, as well as for pr projects which mitigate and adapt to cl uh, climatic change. We didn't produce climate change, but we suffer from it. And it is really uh, expensive to prepare for the effects of such change, like floods and droughts. The Ecuadorian government will admit certificates of guarantee for the nominal value of these compensations. The real backing of the guarantees would be the investments carried out with the capital fund, and they could be called in at the time when Ecuador would fail to comply with the agreement or start extracting uh, crude oil. But there's a more profound historical idea, which is that someday, and under the concept of net avoided emissions, these uh, Yasuni certificates of guarantee would serve as carbon credits. And may God grant that they will one day be recognized by any international agreement, such as the Kyoto Protocol. Right now, they are not recognized, and they need bilateral political agreements to become effective, considering this initiative as a pilot project. That is to say, we would admit certificates. If we were Kyoto, uh, we would give these as carbon credits. These mean the same. These are avoided emissions, but they are not recognized. Maybe, hopefully, someday Kyoto will be broadened and uh, uh, with all I have to say that the United Nations, uh, the United States did not ratify Kyoto. Hopefully these certificates will be recognized and can be traded on the, mar on the market and be acquired by companies that need to fill their co pollution quotas. So perhaps we might reach bilateral agreements with some countries to obtain greater contributions from the countries, uh, the companies of those countries, and we can use those certificates in those countries as carbon credits. It's important to emphasize, it's extremely important because we are very concerned with the dignity of our country. We must emphasize that the principal contributor is Ecuador itself because for what because what is most what is economically in the best interest of the country is uh, the exploitation of oil whose current this this is not this is 14 billion dollars worth and we need those billions of dollars for the development of the country so that is to say we are renouncing a tremendous amount of money it, it's the most profitable source of money for us but how can we what can we buy how much food can we buy for our children how many books can we buy for our students how many highways can we uh, purchase with that environmental sacrifice but the other option would give us money so we need those assets highways and schools for the development of the country furthermore we are talking about the most mega diverse region in the plan on the planet the Yasuni Park the in the Amazon rainforest a true marvel this initiative is a clear commitment on the behalf of one country to confront climate change and global warming, where I must emphasize most of the sacrifice falls on the shoulders of the Equatorian people. Uh, you know, you, you could view this as charity. We are good-hearted. We're going to give a charitable contribution in that way. I won't have to pay tax. We are not requesting charity. This is a commitment everywhere where the main contributor is Ecuador. And as the ex-president of the General Assembly of the United Nations and a dear friend of mine, Father Miguel Liscotto, the Yasuni ITT initiative is the most concrete proposal which has been presented in the history of humanity to combat global warming. It means it means moving from rhetoric to concrete facts. Some may think that if we don't exploit the Asuni oil, it might be exploited elsewhere, and the situation will change too much. Perhaps in the short term, uh, uh, one producer who doesn't deliver oil can be replaced by another. 
uh, given in, uh, current installed petroleum capacity. But in the long term, the reduction of CO2 emissions is real because the oil is a non-renewable natural resource and therefore it's finite. The estimates on the world reserves of oil forecast that at the current rate of extraction, world production of oil will only last 40 years. In that, at that rate, the no extraction of oil reserves is indeed a net contribution. Furthermore, the Asuni initiative foresees that the financial resources that will be obtained will be invested in new projects that will absorb or reduce additional CO2 emissions, such as avoided deforestation. We pay families to maintain forests, but that means permanent expenditures. It's a substantial fiscal sacrifice, and the opposition criticizes us, but it's an efficient way of getting the families to take care of the, for of the forest. I must emphasize that if that unemployed family doesn't receive a direct benefit of maintaining the forest, nothing will stop them from cutting the forest down. Uh, programs of avoided deforestation, reforestation, and the development of clean sources of energy. The potential for joint re uh, reduction potential it, it, it reaches an uh, estimated value of at least 820 million of, to of tons of reduced CO2. We are moving, we're changing our electric generation in our country. That, that means changing our a highly polluting source of energy for a much cleaner renewable source of energy. There are 820 million tons of CO2 that can be avoided through the financing of this project, and then there are 407 million which will stem from the non-extraction of petroleum. So we would indeed be avoiding more than 1,200 tons of CO2 emissions. The specific projects in which Ecuador will invest uh, resources from the ITT fund are the following. All of this has been defined and signed off on. Protection and the uh, efficient administration of 45 protected areas. And let, uh, you know, we really appreciate Costa Rica. Costa Rica normally has been positioned as the country of, in, of the environment because 26% of its territory is protected areas. Well, it turns out that Ecuador has about the same proportion, but it's five times larger. So Costa Rica has about um, 5,000 uh, hectares. Uh, I don't know exactly how many, but if you could, someone could check out the statistic on that. 50,000? 50,000 square kilometers. Well, we can't have that many. Well, I don't remember. We have five times as many uh, protected areas in absolute terms as, as Costa Rica because percentage-wise, we have the same percentage of our territory protected, but we're five times larger. So, to me, it would be, you know, I, I could continue signing decrees, setting up um, protected areas, but if I don't have any forest rangers, if I don't have resources to protect those protected areas, it's all a sham. So uh, protection and efficient administration of 45 protected areas and those that may be created in the future. Reforestation of a million hectares. We really have an ambitious program for reforestation. C, a change in the uh, energy supply of Ecuador to the clean energy systems. It's a disaster what the neoliberal governments of the past left us as an heritage. Ecuador has tremendous water wealth but only 40% of our energy comes from water resources and more than 50% comes from thermal energy and it's highly polluting. We have an aggressive accelerated project um, of changing uh, thermal energy to hydroelectric energy. D, uh, moving the country, Im improving the country's energy efficiency, better heat and cold conservation. E, financing of the product, 
of the production, education, and training of the rural communities in the areas of influence of the projects so that they can improve their, le their li living standard by through agriculture, ecotourism, and other forms of sustainable production. F, investment in science and technology to take efficient and sustainable advantage of our biodiversity. The amount of knowledge that exists about our biodiversity, we have a tremendous unexplored wealth. There's still, uh, we only know a small part of the plants that have been studied for their medical value. So, uh, Yasuni is, a nat is the largest natural laboratory in the world, the richest natural laboratory in the world, and what can be discovered is practically infinite. The natural park of Yasuni has been considered one of the places of the greatest biodiversity in the planet. It was created in 1979 and was declared a world biosphere reserve by the UNESCO in 1989. It covers 982,000 hectares in the upper Napo Basin in western Amazonas. Its strategic location near the an equator and the Andes mountain chain provides it unique climate conditions in the Amazon with a relatively uniform and elevated temperature and humidity. Scientists agree that the unique value of the park because of its extraordinary biodiversity, its good state of preservation and its cultural heritage with 2,274 species of shrubs and trees the park lodges in one hectare alone 655 species more than the total of native species of trees of the United States and Canada put together the Yasuni brings together the greatest densities of species in uh, amphibians, mammals, birds, and uh, plants in the Amazon. The, sing the unique values of the park can be explained for various reasons. Stability of its climate, and high levels of precipitation, and high and regular temperature during the various uh, seasons. The diversity of its earth uh, leads to different ecosystems in uh, dry and lands and floodlands. National Park is therefore the is also the place where two peoples that decided to cut themselves off voluntarily from Western society lives, the Tageri and the Taromenani. They're not in contact with Western civilization and their habitat is the National Park of Yasuni. To sum up, what the ITT Yasuni Initiative proposed could together with the concept of net avoided of emissions is precisely the possibility of redefining the responsibilities regarding the management of global public assets. It offers a concrete alternative to reduce em emissions, conserve biodiversity, and guarantee the survival of the native peoples. Nevertheless, the, in spite of all these beautiful things I just uh, mentioned, regarding this initiative, in spite of all the uh, congratulations, if we got one dollar for each congratulation, we've already reached our goal. The global responsibility to our call has been poor. Without considering the exchange of debt with Ita Italy, we would have gotten there without Yasuni, because we do that every so often. Without considering this exchange of debt, 49 million dollars, what currently exists in the fund doesn't even reach 5% of what we planned on collecting by December of 2011. I can't sacrifice the Equatorian people. We have $14 billion lying in the ground in present value. That's more than twice the total program of investments of the entire Equatorian government. And let me tell you, we need that investment. So, although we can have explications explanations for this poor global response, such as the world financial crisis and particularly the European financial crisis, or the scarce incentives to mitigate climate change as a result of the failure of international negotiations today, with more experience, with uh, some distance covered, it is undoubted 
uh, it can't be questioned that the initiative is undeniable, it's praiseworthy, and cannot be declared in the face of the ecological and climate crisis of the planet, but the poor international response is simply the reflection of the meager commitment to combat on the global scale climate change. Those countries that are, have the greatest degree of responsibility for climate change are now those that are blocking reaching a global agreement to avoid the emission of greenhouse gases. There are even countries that oppose a second period of commitments within the Kyoto uh, uh, Protocol. Commitments which in and of themselves were insufficient and they don't even plan to fill those minimum objectives. The commitment and active participation of the citizens of the world, of you young people, of academicians, of activists, of philanthropists, and the private sector is fundamental for us to demonstrate that there is another way to live right. We've moved from living in a world of proletarians to a world of squatters, a world of unemployed, a world of climate refugees. We are living the area of the indignant, the indignados. Our capacity for creative indignation has brought us together and is what commits us in favor of this initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Ecuador presents to the world the Yasuni ITT initiative. Thank you very much. And I go The problem is the quantity of questions because for me it's no problem to answer directly the questions. Okay. But how to select them? That's a question. Yeah. That's a good Do you have some questions? Joaquin? So you're from Spain. You're one of the indignant ones, huh? You have to see what we're indignant against. That's the question. You have to look at the form and at the content. Thank you very much, President. We're now going to open uh, the floor to some of the questions. I'm going to read some of the questions, and you'll answer what you can. You said that in the case, in case you didn't receive international su financial support, you would have to extract petroleum. If that's the case, what do you think would be the consequences for the indigenous communities? Bearing in mind, and. and and the implications for your presidency, considering the basis for the native and uh, environmental movements. There are many movements that support the government, of course. You know, uh, um, human beings can be a uh, obstacle for um, uh, nature, but we can't be so fundamentalist. But there's a second uh, plan B, which, which, uh, uh, Timmy. The Timi uh, mine is 10% uh, out of the park, so we could extract oil from there. Remember, there were three fields, uh, Timi, Tambocho, and Spingo. Tambocho is 10 kilometers inside the park. We are doing, carrying out studies for horizontal drilling. And I have to be responsible with my people, and Ispingo is in the heart of Yasuni. We would not touch that because it's in the middle of the national park. So, 
Why didn't they do this from the beginning? Because remember, it's not just conserving the park. I must emphasize the idea of net avoided emissions, in spite of the fact that in this way, the extraction of a large percentage of the um, oil, but Ishbingo is the largest part, but it's in the heart of the, reserve, the nature reserve, in spite of the fact that we can take it out with a minimum environmental impact, there will be an impact. So that's why we've infest, uh, emphasized the concept of net avoided emissions. Uh, of social and economic support and the urgency need of major infrastructure, tra transportation and refinery process equipment and uh, machinery. Since uh, the API lease, Ecuador crude uh, to two, three, uh, two, three times less than the current oil price. No entiendo a qué 11 millones se refiere. I don't know what 11 million they're talking about. Uh, you know. ¿Quién hizo la pregunta? Who asked the question? Who, who, what were you referring to here? Ah, 11 billion, 11 million barrels. Yes. Bill. The f you're just considering the total revenue and you have to deduct the extraction costs. No, that is calculated. We have about 14 billion. The initial proposal was when the oil price was a lot lower. We did this in 2007. The oil price was uh, half now. Ecuador is now losing a lot more. That's why I emphasized. It's a good question. You're saying to me that what well, the most intelligent thing would be to take out the money for the Ecuadorian people. I agree with you. What we're trying to do is to make us co-responsible in a problem that we didn't create, the, the um, struggle against climate change. But we're not going to play, we're not going to be anyone's fool here. It's a total contradiction because the beginning of the plan was, gentlemen, we will leave oil underground. Oil we have a right to exploit, but you have to take responsibility, joint responsibility for at least half the value of it. I'm interested in uh, conserving the Jasuni Park and the well-being of the Equatorian people, I respect your opinion, but it's, I think, the opposite. If we, they, they don't give us 20 cents, but we keep, uh, we preserve Jasuni, that'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, Look, let's not be unfair. People have respected the rules and wrote them down. I... Have you been to Ecuador? Who told you that? Did you read this in the papers? Well then, you've just seen the best example of press manipulation. Come to Ecuador. You'll be able to say whatever you want, whenever you, wherever you want. All right, if anybody wants to ask a question, you can ask a question freely. And I think we're free to do that here. Please, let's respect that. It's not enough. Are your uh, is your government interested in energy efficiency? The question is beyond the system efforts on reducing the electric demand with light bulbs and, and refrigerators. Why not to create an actual financial structure to make the energy savings, electrical and fuel, negotiable products to finance energy efficiency projects in the market? Bueno, estamos haciendo cosas similares. Por We're doing similar things. For the first time in the country, we are discussing energy efficiency. We're talking about the diversification of uh, the energy matrix. We basically do not have incandescent light bulbs, which uh, consume a lot of energy. We have a, a saving light bulbs, energy saving bulbs. So we've uh, put a stop and it is now uh, banned to purchase other kind of light bulbs. We have another program that's interesting. It's called Uh, renovadora, it's to change your refrigerator or your appliances. The state will pay 
an X amount of money for you to discard your electrical appliances that are old and that consume too much energy. We do this with cars as well, by the way. We destroy it, we destroy it, and uh, but uh, we, we destroy this and recycle it in an, in an efficient uh, plant. One other question, what's uh, Ecuador's uh, guarantee so that this treaty will be uh, kept and will you have laws? Yes, if this initiative works, we will legislate it. Do remember these certificates are binding. If the Ecuador does not fulfill its obligations, we could be sued and we have to take on our responsibility. Next question. Say Jasuni Itate is successful and um, taking into account the oil crisis that we expect, what kind of protection will you have in order to protect its, the biodiversity from other governments that may try to destabilize the country? Well, now you've mixed up uh, environment and political destabilization. <laughs> I believe the biggest guarantee against any foreign uh, intervention is that after four and a half years, and eight consecutive elections for the, um, and who, we, from a government that doesn't respect freedom of expression, according to some. I think the best example is my government has 70 percent support. I think that's the best guarantee against any foreign intervention. In terms of other policies to uh, say, uh, save the environment, it's not just us. It's not just me. We have a working tip. We have so many people working on this. There are very few governments in the history of humanity, perhaps, that have made so much progress in terms of the environment. We have the greenest constitution in the country, in the planet, the first in uh, history afterwards was uh, the Bolivian, for example, which uh, gave rights to the Pachamama, the Mother Earth. People used to make fun of us, but one century ago, people, uh, corporations got rights, businesses profitable businesses had uh, rights, now the earth has rights and anybody could sue. You can demand to respect the environment. Maybe no constitution other than ours has this. We're working on regulations to preserve our genetic resources so that foreign agents cannot come in and remove our ancestral uh, features like the ayahuasca which was always known by our people, it was taken out of the country and it's patented in the U.S. We discovered it, we've always used it, and now we need to pay royalties. So we want to avoid piracy of biodiversity and genetic piracy. We now have a strong law uh, and uh, in agreement with the Constitution to preserve the environment beyond Yasuni's initiative. We have other projects and policies in course. Another question. Uh, about the press a little bit and the relationship between the press and the, your government. What uh, role do you see for the media in this initiative? Well, you can't ask for favors from the press. It needs to provide information, but maybe it's too much to ask from some uh, press uh, agencies in Ecuador. This afternoon I will discuss that elsewhere, but uh, uh, the press is very capitalist thick. I guess it's a basic problem, either here, everywhere. Private businesses, profitable businesses who are uh, providing a asset for everyone. Usually it's uh, not done by people, but it's done by private corporations. In order to avoid this conflict of interest or interests, interest between profit and what I need to inf uh, inform people of we need better professional ethics. There's probably people like that here, but not in Latin America. For example, when uh, we came to power, out of the seven national TV channels, five belong to bankers. So you can imagine if they wanted regulation, if we wanted to regulate banking, they had a media campaign for two months set, uh, setting us to be completely incompetent, for example. And in terms of the media tradition here in this country, and I've lived here in the U.S., I know this, it may have its excesses, but it has nothing to do with Latin America press. It's really, it can hide. Here, it would be, uh, it, uh, it would be unheard of hiding 
information. But over there, the press believes they can decide because of uh, created interest what they must report or not. We've been, in, in sometimes there's even lies told on behalf of uh, business interest. I uh, sued the biggest newspaper for an outrage lie. Last uh, year, they said there was a, an attempt to coup d'etat in Ecuador. I almost died. The, the uh, newspaper said I was a criminal and I was, a, I was committing crimes against humanity because I ordered uh, people to shoot, and uh, they couldn't prove it. I said, we'll stop this trial, we'll stop the lawsuit, but this is, in, in, this is injury, this is uh, defamation. You know, everybody can have, most countries, most Latin American countries, you go to jail for uh, defamation. I've won twice already. I've told them from the beginning, I'll stop everything if you could recognize your own lie. Admit to it and apologize, but not to me, to the Equatorian people because you've lied. But they're so arrogant, they're beyond good and evil, so I need to give up my right to sue them because they are the media, so everybody has to just take it? No. It's very hard, the struggle against this abuse and excess uh, made by the media. So get some more information. The media in Latin America has nothing to do with the media tradition in the U.S., which is much more ethics, serious, and professional. In fact, here, there are big uh, corporations. But national media over there in Latin America belong to half a dozen families that they handle it as if it was a feud, as if it was a, a feud. So they, they, they do their own interests. And they themselves call themselves against the power. I don't know what they mean. How could you have power in an, in an, uh, the, without democracy? The only legitimacy you can claim to power is you had money to purchase the newspaper. But if it's against the government, it's better politicians, so they're the opposition. What are they? The problem is that they are opposition, yes, for certain gov against certain governments, because otherwise you can just go see what happened in Chile. The opposition of, 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 of uh, Salvador Allende in Chile, but they were the uh, uh, biggest supporters of uh, the dictatorship. We can't forget that, what happened with the press. Last question, Mr. President. I know you need to uh, go and you have other things to do. So, listen, Voltaire said, could you please Inform yourself so you won't you won't uh, you won't uh, sound bad. Or you you won't say dumb things. Please just go read it. So you won't look bad if somebody's talking about sabotage, terrorism. Please don't interrupt me. Please, please don't be so spoiled. Listen. And then within that big article, you say, you say that it's a crime to block roads and burn. Uh, burn tires. In the U.S., it is a crime to do that, but in my country, they said this is sabotage and terrorism. If they accuse somebody for blocking a road, what does the press publish? They uh, accuse someone of sabotage and terrorism. No, they're being uh, accused of a crime that's part of the code and in the new penal code so that media can't manipulate. We're, not, we're changing sections, but the objective fact is that in Ecuador, Colombia, or even the, or the U.S., if you block roads, if you kidnap policemen, if you burn ambulances, is, is a crime. Whatever you call it, whatever, uh, if it's under the code sabotage and terrorism or not, doesn't mean it's not a crime. So, truth be told, it must be told fully. Otherwise, you're lying. No problem, you can keep asking me questions, but please do respect others' rights to ask questions. We can continue, please, let's continue. But it's a little bit annoying that you're trying to take someone else's right to ask a question. One more, one more question. We're in a, an academic environment, could we please respect that? Please, respect your turn.
Okay, what would you tell all university students, all Latin American, and especially Equatorians, but Latin Americans and all the university students, what would you tell them? What would you tell them if they want to support your values, defend these kind of projects? What would you tell them? What uh, should they do? Don't prepare to be part of society and just be uh, have a position. Prepare yourselves to transform the world, and then especially Latin America. We live in the most unequal region in the world. We don't just need a good heart. We need capacity. We need ability so that we don't just fall into uh, certain leftist uh, childishness. I think I think that's an excellent way to to sum up uh, the, this this morning's wonderful presentation and and this this event. It's a great honor for our university to have uh, President Correa here. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and uh, we're going to going to stop now because we have other the president has other things he he must do. But I'd just like to once again thank everyone and thank thank you, Mr. President, for You're your welcome. participation. Thank you. Thank you.